this new interactive format where we strongly encourage your participation uh, to engage in the much needed conversation on how to improve the quality of education in Indonesia. Uh, I'm Ariane Utomo and joining me in asking your questions today, we have um, one of our update containers, Dr. Daniel Fiedadu Alto Indonesia Project of the ANU, Dr. Chris Bjork of Pastor College, uh, Dr. Teh Lee of the Indonesian Institute of, Institute of Sciences, and Professor Kasli Jalal of Andalas University. Please join me in welcoming our <laughs> so before we go any further, I would like to briefly explain uh, the loose structure of our discussion today. To get the conversation going, I would be using my privilege as a moderator to, to ask it. a question to each of the panelists. And then I will turn to the floor and take your questions uh, three batches at a time. I also have one written question from the audience not a popular option that we collected yesterday. So I will read it out through the course of um, the discussion. And finally, I have reserved perhaps the last 10-15 uh, minutes uh, for some of the panelists to briefly present their concluding comments. So um, the underlying question that we are trying to address here today is how to improve the quality of education. But before even going there, the question that's been bugging me as a researcher and as a mother with two young children is how do we improve the quality of something without actually being sure whether we're measuring it correctly in the first place, right? Most publications that I see generally use national exam scores um, as a measure of both students and teachers' performance. Do you think this is the best way to measure education quality in the case of primary and secondary schools? Now, I know Daniel published a paper on student performance not too long ago, so would you probably like to start with a brief response? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Erin. Um, so, I think it's, first, it's good to acknowledge that it's really hard to measure quality, but as researchers, if you want to measure quality and then have you know, identify ways to improve it. I think first, that quality measure, whatever it is, has to be objective. So you can't ask a student, do you, do you think that you're smart? You, can't ask, you cannot ask questions like that. Um, secondly, it has to be comparable across uh, the country. For If you think Indonesia, it has to be comparable uh, with Java and Sumatra and things like that. And uh, finally, it has to be, it has to have enough variation that we can identify policy implications, so what works and what doesn't work. Now, as, as an economist, if you ask me what's the best measure of quality, I would say people's earnings, because that would probably be very objective. But that's like too far in the future. We want to know the quality of primary schools and secondary schools. So what we use is, in my research, I usually use uh, math skills, measured using test scores, and also cognitive skills. Uh, yes, but there's no single measure of yeah. So what do we really mean, Daniel, when we say we want to improve the quality of education? Are we talking about extending compulsory schooling from 9 to 12 years? Are we talking about um, having criti critical thinking graduates with great problem-solving skills? Are we talk talking about overtaking South Korea and Japan uh, in international math? Any thoughts on this question uh, uh, from your presentation yesterday? Yeah, I, I think uh, quality is a sitting that always move according to time, to location, to the whatever the stakeholders uh, see the quality in their perspective. So uh, for that reason, uh, quality can be uh, referred to standard. You have you have to decide, uh, you have to define the standard, and then if you fulfill that standard, and then you reduce the quality education. Or if a loose term, you can also uh, refer quality to the expectation of the parents, of the community, of your stakeholders. A and then the, the another uh, way to uh, to feel the quality is uh, quality is something that you promise to offer, and then you have to fulfill that. Uh, for the government, uh, uh, especially the Indonesian government, we view the quality according to standard. So we designed the eight standard 
First, we would like to aim for what kind of competencies that our graduate by level should have. So we produce one standard of competency. Second, to achieve that, what kind of content of the education need to be provided. Uh, so we, we produce also the set of the uh, uh, content. Standard. And then we also would like to allow the flexibility. So we develop the standard of process. Uh, you know, to be flexible, to be referred to the best practice, but also locally relevant and, and contextual. Uh, so then uh, the process in terms of the description is very, very uh, simple because it's allowing teachers and all stakeholders can play around, but they have to aim for the uh, graduate competencies and have to ensure the minimum content had to be included. And then the third is, uh, the fourth is, how do you evaluate that? Uh, so the uh, standard for evaluation is also important. Here is quite tricky because uh, in, in addition to cognitive measure, we need to have also some kind of the, uh, you know, uh, psychological uh, uh, measure, measurement, and what we call in education, effective measurement, and also psychomotor measurement. So uh, this is quite complicated, and some can be done only by teachers in the classroom, by observation, by uh, portfolio. Some can be have with uh, pencil and paper test. Some can be, you know, be, uh, 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 be provided through uh, 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 assignment or project type. Uh, uh, a program, but I think uh, to to make sure those four important standards can be materialized, you have to come up with what what kind of minimum support from the uh, teachers. So you have to quantify and you have to qualify the teacher to to, to allow them to perform these four uh, outcomes, and then supported by standard for management and supported standard for financing. You have to cost how much is going to cost, and then. Uh, yeah, I think the first standard of competencies, standard of content, standard of process, standard of evaluation, supported by standard of teaching uh, personnel, uh, uh, both uh, teachers and non uh, and other education personnel, and management and financing. So we have eight standard to, to be followed. So if we can really work out, uh, you know, uh, take into account the difficulties uh, measuring the uh, effective and psychomotor. Uh, you mentioned the case of Japan, and uh, I wanted to comment on that because I've been spending the last few years studying educational reform in Japan, and I think it's an interesting case study because we tend to look at Japan as a leader in education and, and as a system worth, uh, worthy of emulation because they have consistently scored at the top of these league tables. But my experience in the schools is that the, the, uh, the focus on testing has actually distorted the ideals of the system, and that the stress on entrance exams um, it causes all sorts of problems for precisely quality. So when I go in and study Japanese primary schools, I'm just stunned at the quality of teaching. And when you ask, what, what do I mean by quality? It's student engagement. Teachers manage to develop critical thinking, strong basic academic skills, social development, all of that, without any testing whatsoever. And it kind of links back to what I was talking about yesterday. And I think it's because there's this strong teaching teacher culture that's focused on the whole development of children. Um, but once the entrance exams enter into the system, all those ideals go out the window. And um, in, the, in the middle schools and junior high schools I visited, um, teaching becomes focused on rote learning, um, very repetitive, kids become disengaged, the gaps between high and low achieving students get much, much larger. And I think it's closely tied to this sudden stress on testing and the association of high test scores with high quality, and I think that's very, a, a very dangerous link to make. Great. Right. So what do you think, Pate? Should we uh, continue to focus on this measurable uh, output in terms of like, student score to measure quality, and maybe kind of quality test, quality of um, education? Well, <coughs> well, I think before we start, we have to make a distinction between, first of all, uh, vocational education, for instance, the STM, STMP or STMA, uh, which are uh, uh, which which should 
provide uh, practical education to to the students, you know, so that they can work in the private sector, yeah, and factories and so on. And I've uh, noticed from people I've met, from a few people I've met who were graduates from the SDM, the technical the technical uh, vocation schools, that they really didn't uh, acquire the necessary skills. Mm -hmm. So because of that, they were often uh, shuttered to uh, administrative functions. They didn't have, didn't have, because I think they were not given the opportunity to work uh, in, 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 in manufacturing first resources. And I think in this respect, we can learn a lot from the German vocational schools, you know. Because one of the reasons why uh, German manufacturers are so highly competitive up until now is because if they get a solid uh, theoretical but also uh, practical education which makes them more suitable to work in the factories. I don't know about the, the, other, uh, the other sectors. When you talk about academic innovation, you have to start from the uh, primary school, uh, uh, high school and the universities and I think uh, for instance if I compare the education I received uh, many centuries ago and uh, which my son received you know of course I'm a product of the Dutch colonial system <laughs> and uh, even so I was never a brilliant student uh, at best slightly above average, but I was inspired by the by Dutch teachers. You know. They were very, very good. You know. And they were all good at, uh, in mathematics and so on. Also, the teachers which inspired me most was uh, you know, were the teachers in history. Anyway, uh, whereas my son hated going to school, you know, it was all as I think it was already mentioned by well, but perhaps by Kapsati. It's more just road learning. First of all, they had to study the Pancasila. They had to study religion. You know, uh, those uh, Muslims students had to study Islam. My son was a Catholic. He has a Catholic. It was just pure road learning. The only time he really enjoyed going to school was when we were when it was. Uh, at the kind invitation of my mentor, Professor Hale, was here a visiting fellow. He went to Cook Primary School and he enjoyed it so much. Then it was Saturday, he said, why do, don't I go to school? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and I think a very important uh, uh, element in enhancing education is to master foreign languages. Uh, because that's the only way where we can get access to private schools. Look, we have, I've, I've had a look at the, at the textbooks which my son had to study in you know, private school. It was just road learning. Uh, just he had to mention, for instance, Sejarah uh, uh, Pahalwan Bangsa, the, the history of national heroes. Just one. The, it, it was just mentioning all like Pangir Antasari from uh, South Kalimantan and so on. Just it didn't, it, it was not put in the proper historical context. And a very basic uh, uh, deficiency in, in language education is that up until now, uh, even if I may, if I am maybe a little bit frank, is that even uh, many PhDs, for instance, economics, from Australia, from America, New Zealand, or the UK, or even Singapore or Malaysia, do not still do not master the, uh, the English language. For instance, uh, uh, eight years ago, I uh, you know the uh, the, economic, the oldest economic journal in Malaysia, economic. Economy of Guam and Asia, eight years ago was transformed into uh, into a full language journal. And I was asked to become an editor together with Dr. Arianto Patunru, unfortunately, he's going here, he left us, 
Now we have a new editor. And the big, I was asked, I know myself very well. It was not because I was not a great economist, which I'm not, but because of the Dutch colonial education, my English is much better. You know? And because of that, I spent sometimes one whole day just in correcting the English of young pe Indonesian PhDs in economics. So, so if, I, if I may summarize your points, uh, importance to master foreign language and reduce uh, our focus on road, road learning. That was road learning point. is absolutely uh, disastrous. Okay. It makes it makes our our young people just like robots. Okay. Yeah. So let's turn to the floor. Uh, three questions. Okay. Uh, I'll follow with with this side first. Uh, with Risa, um, Santi, and Sulati. Thank you. Can you please stand up and introduce yourself? Yes, I have a gender preference and a gender agenda. Okay, um, I'm Risa. I'm a PhD student at the College of Business and Economics of ANU. And my question is about, I mean, we are talking about the problems of Indonesian education and, and then how we can actually improve or contribute um, to the to the development so I mean the show the life has to go on no matter what happened to our education and then I'm very fortunate because uh, my research is about Astra International that's the largest Indonesian company and most admired as well so uh, one of their effort to uh, to fulfill their needs of skilled workers is to establish their own polytechnic, manufacturing polytechnic. And in Indonesia, there are only two manufacturing polytechnic, which is run by the government. So Astra has to queue for graduates. I mean, this polytechnic may be only for produce like 50 a year, while they need hundreds. So they build it, and since 1995. But um, yeah, as also uh, known that Indonesia Indonesian graduate produce 80% of theoretical people and only 20% of vocational people while the, the demand actually at the industry is like 80% vocational and 20% theoretical. So they have this uh, polytechnic since 1995 and you know uh, and then they are so good uh, in terms of link and match because their senior manager, senior engineer teach but then the problem with the government regulation is that how you actually tap in or encourage more participation for the private sector to do similar thing like what ASRA did because they have problem for example the government imposed the regulation that the teachers has to be full, full timers well actually their teachers are their managers and senior engineers who are working for the companies within the group that's why they have very high uh, competency or high vocational skill and they are not a full-time uh, teacher of the polytechnic. So how can you encourage more participation in, in, instead of you know, making barriers for a, a, a private sector to do something about it? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, something that will be from you. Can see you from here? Can you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I would like to point out that interesting point from Pati about the acquisition of foreign language and also to Parsi is uh, mentioning the standard competency. So uh, it's about the bilingual education in Indonesia, about the IAS, ISS and prospective ISS. So ISS is for the International Standard School, the SBE, and prospective ISS for the prospective International Standard School, the SBE. So it is understood that the aim uh, of the ISS is to educate Indonesian children since early on in bilingual Indonesian English, where teachers use English as a medium language for some subjects starting in the elementary school. But uh, in practice, research shows for the past, since 2003, since the promulgation of the law, that there are still human resources and infrastructure problems as most teachers themselves do not have enough acquisition of English. 
and most of the textbooks are translated by teachers from Indonesian to English. So, uh, referring to Fasa's presentation uh, yesterday, uh, which described how Indonesia is still uh, working on improving its quality of education, how the government mitigate this emerging problem in the ISS and prospective ISS. As obviously the standard competency of teaching the bilingual education is not met yet in practice. Morning, uh, I'm Swati from the ANU. This morning I got an invitation to join the uh, movement of parents who are concerned about the curriculum of edu uh, education in Indonesia. And I went through the pages and then I saw there's so many problems parents face. For example, the contents is too much. So uh, there are a mother saying that uh, her kindergarten uh, kid got uh, mathematics homework every day, every single day. And then one mother uh, uh, complained because the, uh, their uh, first grader uh, uh, child get uh, homework asking what is the responsibility, what is uh, a right, and which one we have to do first the, uh, than the others. And then one saying that uh, curriculum uh, development in Indonesia is just uh, changing of the time, but it's barely the same. And uh, I'm wondering, Papasi, why the ministry is so reluctant to change, the, uh, to reduce the contents and to uh, increase the, uh, the quality of the teaching? While well, three days ago, Ministry of Education saying that they plan to in increase the uh, 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 school hours to avoid to avoid the negative impact of uh, outside activities. So, can you explain that, Pak Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have um, three rather um, long insights and questions um, for the panel. So, let's start first with this comment, uh, this question rather, on how do you encourage the government to encourage the private sector? Um, I'm, I'm not in the government anymore. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that whoever, you know, whoever uh, as Indonesian should be part of the government uh, objective because this is uh, our, uh, we are a democratic country so when we elected the government and parliament we have to support any policies uh, uh, designed by them with, uh, with very critical uh, supporting uh, system. Uh, Burisa, uh, I think the government, when I was the uh, DG of education, I also facilitated uh, like uh, polytechnic for just for a uh, Saudi uh, polytechnic manufacturing for the uh, furniture. So we, uh, at me in Bogor is one of the example that the, the uh, foundation developed a very good uh, polytechnic in Solo. Now branch out into Jakarta. So there is facilitation. Uh, for them, usually the permit is not so difficult, but it's not easy for the company to operate by themselves. Astra is so big, yeah, they have, uh, you know, they have not only automotive, they have uh, plantation, they have many others. So with the, uh, you know, the polytechnic is, let's say, at, ma at maximum 500 students, they can operate fully with quality. But less than that, for example, the Gajah Tunggal also trying to, to establish a polytechnic, but now not uh, achieving the standard. So then the question is, how can we facilitate more? Uh, we are lucky now, if for the good intention, uh, Bakri open Bakri University, Ciputra open Ciputra Entrepreneurship University, yeah. and also others uh, uh, innovations, and also contribution from private. So we are waiting for more and more innovation. I think the regulation is allowing them to, to do that, to, to expand, and then they can also uh, get some of the contribution from the government. For example, if they have a certified uh, lecturer, the, that certified lecturer can get subsidy one-time salary of basic uh, salary of PNS, of civil servant in public university, uh, on top of the university salary or foundation salary. If they are becoming full professor, in addition to that, they can get double basic salary subsidy. So if you are a professor 
teaching in private university, aside from your foundation and university salary, you get three times uh, civil servant salary at professor professorial rank. So it's quite quite good. Uh, if the government operate the minimum subsidy from the government for individual student at university level, that will be likely like boss at the at the uh, private. Uh, I mean at basic education. Maybe the way the calculation not completely equal like the basic education because basic education mandated free by constitution. Maybe we can play around on the income, income, uh, you know, uh, con contingent to income, and then the government can play around providing scholarship, full scholarship to uh, whoever potential from lower uh, social economy classes to go to any university, private or public, as far as they show they have a good standard. So uh, it is going on, it's going on, even though we need to speed up. Uh, Santi, uh, uh, when we come up with the, you know, this is the, the, the cabinet, the first, uh, the first uh, cabinet of uh, Pais Bay, at the time I was involved in the designing the strategic planning. And then the question, uh, in, the, in the law, in education law, uh, it is stated that every district and municipalities ha have to have at least one internationally benchmark school internationally benchmark school at primary level, junior secondary, senior secondary, and vocational. So we have, we have we have been struggling to understand what does the law mean? Internationally benchmark school. Are we going to benchmark the uh, language uh, to be used? Or are we going to, match, uh, to benchmark with the, how the teachers, the competency and the, the way the teacher delivering regardless of the religion, regardless of the, uh, the culture, regardless of the, the language. So, uh, in general, because the law instructed us to do that, and so we come up with the, what we call SBI, Scholar uh, Berstandar International. Uh, because there is no clear definition about the, what is international standard school. Uh, we can go to countries, uh, we can go to ID, etc. But then that's not Indonesian. That's not our our school. So because of that, to give a time, because law instructed us to do that, to give us a time, so we we go with uh, what we call RSPI, Rintisan Sekolah Berstandar Internasional. So prospective international benchmark school. We don't know how far to get to SPI. Uh, because SPI is still being defined. So when several school being defined at RSBI to allow them to uh, expand their school and creating a lot of program for go for let's say international benchmark. So uh, gradually only a very elite school they are ready even for prospective uh, RSBI or prospective international benchmark school. But and then equity come into the picture. So all governor demanded, we're only in Java, we're only in, in Jawa Timur, we're only in Jogja. What about my profit? And then the, the criteria being reduced. And after reducing the criteria, still not from Nusa Tenggara, not from Kalimantan Tengah, and then we go even low. And then we find out some of the teachers yeah, will not be sufficient to perform the criteria. But we have a big country, we have to also do some affirmative uh, action to the uh, the most needy provinces like Papua, Papua Barat, and Nusa and Maluku. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Um Did you have to respond yes. to the question? Uh, Please keep your response brief because uh, I know we've got a lot of yes. really eager audience uh, asking you. Well, <clears throat> look, we are looking for some more. Is it on? We are looking for. Uh, sir. Yeah. We are looking for some models. Look, as far as high school education is concerned, I think the East Asian countries, Japan, Singapore, Korea, provide very good education. You know. So much so that uh, they have really to cram, you, have, you know, to cram, to pass 
to enter the, the in Japan they call it the Shiken Jikoku, the examination hall. They are so tough, but I have, I have many Japanese friends, but once they enter the universities, it's just like an escalator. They just, is it true, Professor Hayashi? You know, and that's why uh, Professor Ichimura, whom Professor uh, Hale also knows, he has, I've talked about education, because he's con con he was concerned with educa university education in Indonesia. He said, he said that Japanese children are not very good. And the same pressure or the Shiken Jigoku, the Kevin Hell, is also applied in Singapore. In my, in my humble opinion, NUS is good, not mostly because they, they are so rich they cannot recruit foreign professors. So, um, we have um, number two, Chris, um, but well, um, maybe we'll get back to um, Suhaki's question um, when you can come up with the next batch of questions. I'd like your opinion actually whether we're actually teaching too much um, children, especially with your work on reform in um, de-intensification yeah, de in the Japanese um, curriculum system. So can you just briefly comment on that? Yeah, I'll be very um, brief. I would just say that coming from the US, I would say that we are probably the worst example of this in terms of <coughs> asking teachers to cover too much at a very surface level, whereas in Japan, Singapore, and other countries, if you look at the textbooks and curriculum, teachers are only expected to cover a very much smaller span of topics, but they have time to explore them in greater depth, as opposed to just touching upon a lot of to topics very, very quickly. And I would add to your comments that, from my perspective, the explanation for Japan's outstanding scores on these international tests is not what goes on in the high school, but the outstanding foundation that's laid in the elementary school. Uh, I'd like to have uh, to answer the question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think this started from the uh, law, national education law. In the law, it is being stated how many subjects, what kind of categories of subject do you have to teach. And then, uh, when we review the comparison of hours, uh, it is uh, the one uh, teaching hours in Indonesia is also almost half of the teaching hours in outside. So because of multiplicity of the subject matter. So I think the government movement right now to review the number of subjects and clustering them rather than uh, teaching individually will help. Uh, do we want to extend into the full day school? That another matter, you know, uh, lunch and also facility etc. But I think that the government and the parliament is uh, thinking along the line. Maybe they need more technical support from all of you. Thank you. So let's move on to your question. Terima kasih. Uh, I'm very proud to get through your gender test. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question about the demographic dividend. No one's talked about it uh, at this conference. Uh, but as I understand it, the implications for education are basically the shift from quantity to quality. Mm. You now have much fewer numbers of people entering at, at younger age groups into the system, and in fact, that's created its own problems. Uh, excess numbers of teachers at primary level and, and so on. So I wondered if uh, the, uh, uh, and also interests uh, in continuing the, the quantity, uh, the expansion of the system, because there's lots of rewards and, and so on. And so I wondered if the, if the panel might uh, reflect on, on some of those, how to get over some of that, those transition issues in, in the broad, in a broad sense. And secondly, uh, there's a conflict between some parts of Indonesia where the quantity issues are still the burning issue expanding access. Other parts of Indonesia were the quality issues of this, of say, Jakarta, they go. Mm. Uh, I wonder if they might, uh, the panel might reflect on those issues. Thank you. Riva Royano, are they, can we talk a little bit about teachers as well? Um, the Indonesia Malaysia program is an amazing leadership program, and Indonesia will benefit from hundreds of Pengaja Muda, who would become future leaders and have a temporary education. <coughs> but I'm still skeptical whether that is an, a viable model to provide 
uh, quality teachers and improve the quality of education on the ground because we basically, if we use that model, we're giving students um, every year a different individual who has zero experience in teaching, no matter how bright and inspiring they are. Now, the thing is, if you consider the fact that Indonesia is just, does not have a shortage of teachers, we have an oversupply of teachers. We have 300,000 teachers in the system that we don't really need. But as Chris pointed out yesterday, we can't really fire them, no matter how high their absenteeism rate and no matter how low their quality is. So, do you think that the Indonesian Najar model is a viable option to at least populate uh, the remote, uh, the schools in remote areas with motivated teachers? Um, even if we, even if we give these these kids a different teacher every year. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sharon Vessel from Crawford at the ANU. Um, when we think about about quality education, there are many ways that we can think about that. And one of the ways of thinking about quality is the experience that children have themselves in school. And we haven't, I think, discussed that a lot. When we start to think about those kinds of issues, issues around the way in which um, lessons are, are taught, the way in which content is delivered become very important. So too do issues of behaviour management within the classroom and discipline. There's not been very much research, I think, done on this issue in Indonesia. The little bit that's been done suggests that certainly in some parts of Indonesia, uh, discipline still takes quite violent and humiliating forms for some children. Um, and that impacts quite dramatically on children's experience, but often on the outcomes we know from, from other research in other places. So I guess part of my question is to ask the panel if they would like to comment on how we should be thinking about children's experience of school as we think more broadly about quality. And also when we think about measurement, um, we were often driven by looking for, as Daniel put it, objective ways of measuring education. There are good reasons for that, particularly when we're looking for global comparisons. But if we look for uh, clearly comparable measures, we can actually narrow the way we think about education. Um, in a way that's, that's not helpful. So while asking a child whether they think they're smart might not give us anything useful or objective, asking children what helps them to learn well, what makes them enjoy school and want to go, what they dislike about school or find fearful about school gives us some really important insights. So I wonder if the panel would also like to comment on how as we think about measuring education, we might look for measures that might be pejoratively labelled subjective, but actually give us some important insights. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to respond to that, uh, to Rifa's question on Indonesia Mengajar. Um, it's a great program, we all uh, accept that. One question that I have as I listen to the presentation is how much does it actually cost? Because if we want to scale it up and um, you know, have it to have broader scope, then it will be uh, very expensive, I suspect. And secondly, the problem with scaling up um, these programs that are deliberately kept small to, to, to have the quality uh, remain high is that once you let scale it up, you, let it, you, you have to let go some of these quality controls. Um, there's probably different level of involvement by the leaders of these uh, programs if you scale it up. And you know, you never know what's gonna happen. And this is why in, we, we see a lot of uh, really great small interventions by NGOs and by other organizations in developing countries. Um, for example, uh, Pratham in India, they have lots of good programs, but there is very little evidence of success when this, these programs are scaled up or adopted by the government because government uh, officials have different incentives and um, also you know, they, they are rewarded differently, punished differently, and there's just not that level of intensity uh, as the NGOs. So yeah, that's my response to the Indonesian Mengajar one. Um, maybe I'll the other yeah. as well. Sure. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I, I found Pak Anas's uh, presentation so inspiring, and that doesn't happen that often at conferences on Indonesian education. So it got my mind thinking, trying to come up with ideas that would be nice follow-up. And in response to your questions, I don't think it's a program that could be replicated. I don't think it could be expanded significantly, but I do think there's a whole lot we can learn from it. From the practical details of things like, we need to do a much better job marketing teaching in Indonesia. I, I was really impressed at the response that people had to that video. 
why can't there be videos like that that are inspiring people to become teachers in public schools? Well, there needs to be more marketing and then follow up to create a new or a different focus, a different type of teaching culture. So for example, Pat Crossley and I have been talking about how to improve teaching work groups. Maybe we need to create MGA and Pain Kakake for new teachers that are separate from those that are kind of dominated by older traditional teachers. And the last thing I'll say is that I strongly believe, and this follows up on what you're saying, that every child deserves to have one inspiring teacher in their life. And I would bet that all of you can remember one teacher like that, and that, I would say, is why you're here. And it's, it's just very sad that so many kids in Indonesia don't have a figure like that in their lives. And a program like Indonesia Mungajar gives us uh, um, you know, ideas about what that can look like. So, um, and they would like to respond to Bakri's concern why the demographic given it hasn't been discussed and the implication on what was meant for the quality of the Yeah, uh, Bakri's uh, Indonesia are lucky now to have the demographic dividend from 2015 to 2045. Uh, uh, so, we still have room to make sure that the graduate at least senior high school and vocational and polytechnic and our bachelor degree will be responding to the opportunity. Uh, I think it is now become a national jargon, demography dividend, and then we even started from ECD, early childhood uh, education and development. So hopefully in the next uh, 10 to 15 years we will produce graduate they can go to regional market also as well as international market but also the most important thing can develop their own region uh, according to the potential in the region a conflict between uh, quantity and quality i think was there uh, but we have to set a standard we have to go for quantity first uh, whatever the quality uh, finding even though we have to take into account we don't want to torture students in the wrong schools. Uh, so the minimum standard for quantity is to be established, but let's go. Every district with lower than expectation have to be well, supported, have to be given a sufficient amount of money, and everybody know why this district get highest the AU or the AK because they need. Uh, yeah, for the primary uh, cohort right now, we would like to use the left uh, classes to start like uh, universalization of the ECD or kindergarten, which is now only 28% or 30% at most, covering the 31, 30 million of Indonesian. So we still have a lot of uh, work to fill the empty classroom of school, Paris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe uh, I would go to Pate to comment on uh, sharing Bessel's excellent observation that maybe we need to focus on children's experience in school as opposed to just measuring their um, outcomes through exams. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, but uh, the focus should be on I think and uh, improving, enhancing the competence of of teachers because they are the most the most crucial factor, which will affect, which will influence whether uh, students from as from the primary school up will be interested in studying rather than playing. That is very important. You know, uh, I would also there's an other other point. I will once again. Just a brief point. Yeah, uh, that that uh, vocational education, technical education, should be very important. You know, uh, one indication of the success in providing practical education is what you call industry, uh, university industry linkages, you know, which has been a very crucial factor in the industrial development of Japan and the United States, which is not available, except in business education. As you may have heard about the Prasitya uh, uh, Graduate Business School. The <laughs> their graduates are immediately picked up by all these uh, corporations. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I have three questions 
but before going there, I actually um, will read out the question that I received yesterday from Andrew, and Andrew Elect. Um, okay, the question is on ICT in education. So we're actually moving from talking about primary and secondary vocational schooling to tertiary education now. So it says, much of the discussion has been based on a very traditional teacher's classroom student model. At a time when most people have access to the World Wide Web, e-learning has the potential to revolutionize uh, education, especially higher education. The resource requirement will be very different. How can Indonesia take advantage of such new opportunities? Others, especially Korea, uh, Korea, are already doing so. Is there room for some pilot projects in Indonesia? And is the Open University a, an, ad an adequate response for this? Um, so, probably I just ask one person. Did you want to no, no, up lastly, uh, before we go to the floor? Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, this is a very attractive idea so, uh, that we discuss in many even. Uh, the reality right now, uh, we we even uh, already provided, for example, during pa Bang Bang, uh, the fresh minister of education, uh, he established a program that to make sure that all, uh, at least public senior high school and prioritize the vocational school should have one lab computer connected with the national IT, securing the, the connectivity, paying the telecom, uh, you know, 100 million billion of rupiah to ensure that the bandwidth is sufficient. Uh, and then, because at the receiving end, they are not ready, the, the old teacher is uh, scary with technology, but we, we, we have some young, or even the son of the, or daughter of the teachers can facilitate. So the program is there. But I think sometimes technology is coming too fast. The, the content is not well developed. The facilitation on the use of ICT for education is not there from the closest uh, expert or uh, facilitator. But you know the, 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 the variation, we have 78,000 villages. We have almost 270,000 schools. For university, uh, during my time as a DG for education, we were able to connect all of the university paid by the government uh, with at least two gigabyte uh, free bandwidth, and then we link to the International Distance Learning Network (IDLN). So we have connected with 70 countries, so we can share our malaria course with Dutch, with Thailand, or learn from uh, uh, business school, from uh, French, you know or in Seattle uh, from Paris or uh, IESE from uh, Spain, for example. So there is, but in terms of the richness, the frequency, and also the percentage of the participation is still low, uh, comparing to Thailand, comparing to Malaysia. Thank you, Mark. So first question to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Richard Pierce from, is this working? Yeah. From Macquarie University uh, some years ago, I have to say. Uh, we'd like to go back to the question of... Can you turn it on, sir? I thought I had. Is that better? Yes. Oh, thanks. Okay. Uh, back to the question of, uh, of uh, quality uh, and, and where we started with that. And advance the view, really, that quality has got... Uh, teaching and learning has got a lot to do with input, measuring inputs and getting better inputs, rather than measuring outputs, which, of course, have to be done as some indication of what you're achieving. But, but the critical thing is inputs. We've been talking about that a lot over the, the, uh, the last couple of days, uh, where the teachers are, uh, turn up at school as the first input, and how long they're there is another. And their tertiary qualifications and upgrading are another. But what they actually do in the classroom is uh, another. And I'd like to put the question to the panel members. If they had to make a vote about improving teachers' credentials, through academic courses, diplomas, and so on, uh, or promoting teacher programs of professional development focused on teachers in the schools, where would they put their money? What would they put their emphasis on? And to ask uh, how it is currently in Indonesia, how it is working currently, in terms of the evolution of the programs. Uh, there was an in-service 
on-service program many years ago. There are other programs now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there a second question from the middle? Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Prasad Vasilega from USW. My question is for Pak Fasil. Uh, in the middle of Pak is sorry, not, not in government anymore, but just your idea because can I, can I say that the money is not a problem when you got because uh, the Minister of Education is almost get 20% of the total budget from the APBN and I can remember during the crisis. 2008, where the, uh, the uh, budget case to go to the constitutional court, the uh, Bama and the main minister doesn't want to get the money because they don't know how to uh, do it with their the money. So I mean, is is that because is in order to improve the quality of the education, it's not about how we try to give the money and how to to spend, but how how we change the the mindset of the education, particularly for the prime primary education, with respect to the cases that happen in uh, Japan, if we focus to the development of the children, not try to burden them with the assignment and books and let them to grow it naturally, it will change the burden of also for the teacher and also the teacher also feel they are part of the education and just for end point. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, a brief uh, comment to that part. Number one, with regard to uh, quality and competence. Uh, often uh, we fail to define what we mean by uh, competence and how, how is that also uh, uh, informed or, or translated uh, to teachers and, and, have, uh, and principal at, at schools. So uh, yes, we, we sort of grab, we kind of know what, what competence means, but when, when it comes to teachers who are there, uh, and they are they are uh, held accountable for ensuring that the students reach a certain uh, competence. Then they often find it uh, difficult to understand what, what does it mean, and also quality. Uh, my our our in our practice is instead of focusing on certain uh, measurements of quality of competence, then it is uh, more of rather abstracts. But it's about let's change our behavior, uh, and and that's through example. And when that is done, I think people will then realize that is the type of uh, educated individuals we like to see our children one day be. So if we can have our teachers be an example, uh, be a sort of a, a role model, I think that would also be uh, an interesting approach. And you mentioned earlier about uh, teachers were inspirational. That is a, an issue that, that we are definitely uh, is dealing now. But now second, I'm commenting to uh, earlier comment with you. Is this model, is it said to be a model? Just quickly. Just very quick. You know Pertamina was not doing well for decades in the SPBU. Now SPBU is, 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 is good. If you go to a, a pompa benzene, it was quite good. Now the surface, the quality of surface is good. Why that is happening? There was cell coming. Does, does cell competitor of Pertamina? Of course not. Cell is too small to compete with Pertamina. But it set a new standard. It set a new benchmark. And I think that's the hope. I don't think if it is being, being uh, multiplied, uh, it will be the approach. I think it should, that we should actually improve our existing system instead of replacing it with the Indonesian uh, model. That, that's one. And then two, with regard to uh, its cost, it is actually only 20% of, of, of the cost if that is being done by government using uh, the unit costs uh, made by the Ministry of Finance. So it's much, much cheaper than if it is the same program run uh, by government. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So perhaps instead of asking um, all the panelists to answer the first question about voting for teachers qualification versus um, working on teachers development. I'm just going to ask perhaps Chris to respond to that quickly and I'll ask him to quickly answer the question that we definitely need. Yeah. That's a no-brainer for me. It would definitely be uh, improving the quality of uh, professional development. More and more credentialing and upgrading. There's some positives, but it's, it's just adding more of what already exists. On a survey that I distributed to teachers, when I asked them, what do you need to improve? What would lead to 
better teacher uh, instructional quality, the number one answer was better professional development. The problem, though, is that the existing system of professional development has a lot, it, it's lacking in many ways. So when I would go to these workshops, they tended to be lecture dominated. Uh, the people leading the professional development would be teaching, uh, instructing teachers on how to fill out forms, it would be very dull. So I, I think professional development is the key, but a different form of professional development than what currently exists. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, to answer to our colleague from UNWC, Fritz, uh, where to start? I think <coughs> we, we should start from school as entity. That's why school-based management is very important. But to allow the better school-based management, we have to have the good principle. Here, we have to, you know, we have to compromise with the political cooperation of the education in the district and municipalities. That's one problem. But it can be done some innovative Bupati and Wali Kota shown that they are very serious supporting the principle allowing the good good candidate to be principal so this need to be replicated second the importance of supervisor because sometimes by the time uh, principal can also change the attitude they become dominating and authoritarian etc but when we have a good a supervisor we can you know we can balance that and the school committee we have those institution already but the quality and also empowerment process in detail at the lower level is not there. That's why, uh, you know, uh, if you want to review, we have a project when I was a teacher, uh, a teacher education personnel, we have a project uh, we review starting from BAN, Badan Akartasi National Aplikan Tinggi, reviewing the a program in accrediting the teacher training study program, empowering them, put more money so they can have a good uh, uh, borang or you know uh, form and a uh, process for accreditation a uh, giving program to uh, teacher training that want to improve the qualification of the graduate bringing the lesson plan from japan bringing realistic mathematics from Dutch into the system and then preparing the mempan uh, state ministry of apparatus to recruit the best of the graduate and we have induction program for one year by law now uh, if you go to civil servant, even you, you you graduate from professional teacher training, you cannot be immediately becoming civil servant. You have to prove one full year for induction. If you send your teacher, principal, at which you are working with, allowing, giving okay, and then you become full civil servant. Maybe we can do also uh, in the private school. So, a lot of problem, but uh, one step by step can be solved, inshallah. Thank you. Amen. Just one, uh, we have time for one more question. We have one from the gentleman here, right at the back. Thank you. Uh, David Slocco, USAID Higher Education Project. Um, two observations and then a, a, a question. Uh, those yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1967, very poor country, East Africa, Tanzania, the president inaugurated the University of Dar es Salaam and he said then uh, that uh, if the graduates did not serve the nation they had stolen from the poor just as surely as if they entered into their villages the Shamba at night and took their corn. So he inaugurated the program, every graduate had to work for two years like a, a domestic peace corps. It failed later on because the country changed, matured, etc. First observation. Second, uh, in the first week of June this year, I was very fortunate to spend an hour and a half with the new, newly inaugurated, installed rector of the University of Gajamada. Uh, he is not a graduate of ANU, he's a graduate of Adelaide. But he mentioned the system that is in operation there that would be familiar, and I think uh, Anas indirectly referred to it, that graduates spend three months in service uh, to the community, irrespective of the discipline, before they get their test aim or their graduation certificate. Uh, I want to follow up uh, Riva's very important question about scaling up. Do you think what is done in that university, okay, and, and possibly in others, 
uh, could become more widespread in Indonesia, given the privilege that this very small number of graduates have in attaining uh, a degree from the top of the education system when there's such poor quality and lower quality opportunities available at other levels of education, including technical and vocational. Question is, should, is that a scale up laterally rather than scale up? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to know that, that um, time's up. So, um, did you perhaps want to any other slide? We have one question there. One question, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, Paul Can we have a Paul King, Brisbane University, Brisbane. My interest area is uh, sustainable livelihoods <coughs> and alternative livelihoods for people in the Outer Islands, especially NKT. Um, what I'd like to make a comment on is the books and resourcing in schools. We had a comment before that there's an oversupply of um, teachers for schools, but I tend to think that there's an undersupply of books and resource, other resourcing in schools. And I can base that on some visits to some schools in Capella where I provided one of my, my key informant um, schools with some school books there and the teacher asked, where did you get these from? Can I borrow them to copy them so that I can use them for the class textbook? When I visited Sakola Dasa in Papella, I went in there and I asked the teachers, um, what's your greatest need here? And it said it was a question with notice, but it was a question without notice, about five cent books. So I'd like to ask the, about the um, um, Government of Indonesia's policy on the supply of textbooks for schools, and also for OSE that are building a lot of schools around Indonesia and providing the containers for education. Are they providing the, um, an annual supply of textbooks for the teachers as well? within the schools. What's their policy about? Okay. So the first question. Just any like the big comment? Which one? The book? Just quickly then, thank you. Yes, just quickly. Uh, whether we have to make it compulsory or not, uh, I don't think anything has to be compulsory, uh, but that's a personal opinion. But also it depends on the governance because this this program where students spend three months or all number of months in the village helping uh, the villagers that's been around for a long long time and often we just see you know a small street or something going on so depends on the focus and on the governance of these things it it has the potential to be to have a high impact but it depends on a lot of things okay great so in response to the school textbooks yeah. just a brief up to 1990 from the independence a textbook being provided by government, produced by government by inviting the authors and purchased by the government, distributing by the government to all schools. And then the quality is reduced because less less the good writer, author, uh, contribute to the government uh, uh, public school. And then we buy, the, the government buy the textbook from the best available in the market from 19, the end of 1995 to 2000 something. Uh, because the price is quite high because we, 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 we buy the best book and a lot of comment, this is monopoly, only very rich uh, publisher and author can get access. So we, uh, you know, the government eliminate that and then try to uh, buy the right copyright from the authors and then put online, everybody can download, everybody can print, school be given block grant and district can also print by locality and every books reviewed by a group of experts under the national uh, standardization team. Uh, unfortunately, this is not being continued now. The new government trying to also change now maybe re-centralized again, uh, published by the government, produced by the government, distributed by the government. So we have the, came to the cycle again. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay, so I believe we have spent the last 35 minutes generating a lively and much needed conversation on multiple aspects of the education system. 
So I hope that our exchange of my insights and ideas this afternoon would serve as useful starting points. Yeah, instead of answers, perhaps this would be useful starting points uh, for all of us seeking to answer the question of how is it that we could improve the quality of education in Indonesia. Can you please join me in thanking our